All right, here we are. It's uh, early June of 2011, and I was contacted by another brother, and, and he said that he would like to hear a message on marriage and the resurrection. What happens to a Christian married couple, both husband and wife are saved, what happens to them when they die and they go to be with the Lord? Are they still going to be married in eternity? And there's a lot more to cover there, but we'll go through that as we uh, get into this message. Now, uh, we're going to start out. We're going to be reading a lot of scripture. This is another one of the special studies. So there's. I'm just going to be reading the scriptures. Not going to be much time to look this up. But make sure that you uh, mark these verses down or pause the recording and go and take the time to look them up and make sure I'm not lying to you. Okay, so we're going to start out in Matthew chapter 22. We're going to look at verse 23. Okay, it says here, The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there, that there is no resurrection, and asked him. Now, I'm going to stop there for just a minute. The Sadducees were a religious sect that did not believe in the resurrection. And if you want a little bit more scripture on that, you can go to Acts chapter 23, verses 6 through 8. We'll read this quickly. It says here, But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Okay, Paul was on trial there, and the Jews were bringing up all kinds of accusations, and he saw that they were actually two different groups, Sadducees and Pharisees. So he actually made a little problem there for them. Verse 7, Acts 23, verse 7. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. Uh, there's no problem with you as a Christian causing division among the lost. Okay, Verse 8, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Okay, it doesn't mean the Pharisees were right. Uh, they were just right in that one point. But you see there again that the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. So why would they be asking Jesus about a question about the resurrection? Well, they were trying to trap him. You think about the arrogance of doing that. Here you have sinful men trying to ensnare and trap God manifest in the flesh. Not a real smart thing to do. But getting back to the passage there in Matthew chapter 22, we'll continue here. Verse 23, I'll read it again, and we'll continue down through. It says here, The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and asked him, uh, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother, likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Now before I continue, let me just stop there for a minute. And it's kind of funny because they said about, you know, we had one with us and this is what happened. How much you want to bet that they were making the whole thing up? How much you want to bet that they didn't have a man among them that went through that situation there? I mean, that would be a pretty rare thing there to have seven men... None of them are married, and each one in succession goes down through, and they each marry this woman, and then they die, and then they marry the woman, and then they die, and then she finally dies when they're all gone. Sounds like a made-up story, and it probably was. But the whole point of it was they were trying to trap Jesus. But we'll continue here and get Jesus' answer. Verse 29, Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? Let me just stop again there. He answers their question, but then he goes on to rebuke the fact that they don't believe in the resurrection. He says, I know what you're doing, Here's the answer to that question. They don't, you don't get married in, in the resurrection. But by the way, speaking about the resurrection, and he goes on to teach them about it. Uh, verse 32, it says here, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, 
they were astonished at his doctrine. That happened a lot. Because, you see, anybody that preaches the Word of God, and Jesus Christ specifically, because he is the Word of God, manifest Word, but anybody that speaks the plain Word of God in words that are easy to be understood, they're always going to blow people's minds because they're used to hearing these religious hypocrites. The Sadducees were comparable to your modern-day Catholic or Greek Orthodox. Okay, they were like to go around in long robes, you know, the Pharisees as well, and greetings in the marketplaces, you know, and everything else. That's the kind of men they were. And if you ever hear a Greek Orthodox or, or the Pope, you know, quote-unquote preach, it's one of the most boring things that you've ever heard in your life. Oh, it's just, ugh, it's horrible. I mean, listen to them sometime. It's just, ugh, it's bad. So, Jesus spoke very plain, and it's interesting because the Bible says that the common man heard him gladly. The common people heard Jesus very gladly because they could see he was being real with them. It wasn't some religious ritualism that was created by men, like the Sadducees and Pharisees. Okay, the Sadducees and Pharisees would not quote Scripture. They weren't, you know, they were ignorant of the Scriptures. They might have been doctors and, and highly, you know, educated but they were quite ignorant of the scriptures, and Jesus pointed that out right in front of everybody. You know, really something. But I want to make a few points about this passage of scripture. Okay, first of all, Jesus says in the resurrection that we are going to be as, you know, we as Christians, they, which is what Jesus said, but he says there that we are going to be as the, quote, angels of God in heaven. Now, I can't get into all the, the scriptures behind this, but there are no female angels in your King James Bible. Okay, All the angels, when they show up, they are always men. And they don't have wings either. Now, if you want more information on that, I have a whole sermon on angels, what are they, I think is what it's called. And you can listen to that. We go over a lot of scriptures there. And, you know, it's a regular Sunday sermon. And I show you what angels are are and were, you know, in your Bible. Okay, uh, the second point I want to make is, which was brought up there, if a Christian woman married seven different Christian men and they all died of natural causes, which man would she be married to in heaven? Okay, that, now that's a good question. Now again, I don't think that that's going to happen. You know, that, I mean, you talk about a, a, a bad luck type of a woman you know, or, or something attached to her that's wrong, you know, that if she'd marry, you know, seven men and they all die natural causes, that'd be something's really wrong there. I don't know. But just assume for a minute that you have a believer that is married and their husband or their wife, depending on what they are, dies. And there have been many cases of that. Uh, William Carey, I think he was married at least twice. And it wasn't that he got divorced. His his wife, his one wife died. And there have been other missionaries that have had their wives die, other pastors. I believe Bob Jones Sr. Uh, was married two times. His first wife died. Now, let me ask you a question. If you need to understand this thing of what happens in the resurrection, if you believe and want to believe that you'll be married, your wife that you've had here, she just continues to be your wife forever, what about your first wife, if you're married for the second time, first wife died? Or if you were married as a woman and your first husband died and you married again, what are you going to do when you get to heaven? I mean, is a man going to get up there and say, oh, uh, Susie, uh, remember uh, I told you about Karen? Well, here she is. Um, this is kind of awkward. I guess, well, we're all going to be living in the same mansion. You know, Susie, you'll cook one week. Karen, you'll clean the house that week. And then you switch, you know. See, it, it's a problem. In the resurrection, we become as the angels of God. Okay, that's very important to understand. And here's something else, and I kind of touched on this here. Uh, what is the biblical role of a Christian married woman? According to the Bible, Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, it says here, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, 
that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Instruction for a Christian married woman. 1 Timothy 5.14 says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now, let me ask you a question. If you believe that a married woman, a married Christian woman, goes right into eternity like that, is she going to have to cook and clean for her husband forever? She's to be a keeper at home. That's what the Bible says. You know, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you, Jesus said. There will be mansions in heaven. Now, is it that the wife is going to have to be submissive to her husband forever? And be a keeper at home forever? And guide the house forever? You see? I mean, you know, is she going to be producing spirit babies when she gets to heaven like the Mormons teach? No. I don't think so. You know, is she going to be changing diapers forever? <laughs> some women, you know, some women out there would, would find that to be neat and everything. You know, some women love to be mothers. Others, you know, not so much so. But will she grow old? Okay, you know, you get your, you know, I, I have a, my grandparents, my grandfather died here back in January, and he and my grandmother were married for 72 years. He was 98 when he passed away, when he went home to be with the Lord, definitely saved. My grandmother's 93. She's still around. Now, when she gets to heaven, is she going to be 93? And if she gets to heaven and she's given a young body or something, will the body get old? You know? See, there's your questions that people have, and I'm going to show you what the Bible has to say about it. Okay? I do not believe that we're going to grow old when we get to heaven, by the way. Okay? But... You know, we have to look at the scriptures and see what it teaches and not what we want it to teach. Now we're going to go to the next instance where the same thing happens, where the Sadducees come to Jesus. We're not going to read all the verses because it's basically the same retelling of the story where they came and they said about the brother married a wife and then the other six brothers, you know, had her to wife and then they died and whose wife shall she be in the resurrection. So we'll pick up there. Mark chapter 12 verse 24 says, And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead, that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses, how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of but the God of the living, ye therefore do greatly err. Now, see, they were having a hard time understanding. They were looking at heaven, at the resurrection, with earthly eyes. And what did Jesus say? He didn't say, well, you know, no big deal. He said, ye therefore do greatly err. You are in great error when you try to look at heaven with your earthly understanding. Believe you me, when we get to heaven, it's going to be nothing at all like it is down here. Nothing. I mean, we can read some passages in Revelation and, and a few other places where it describes some of the things about heaven. And you read it, you know, there I think it's Revelation 21 where it describes about the, the streets are going to be gold, as it were, transparent glass. Now, I've never seen clear gold that looks like glass. You say, well, I can't believe in such things then. That doesn't sound scientific. Well, not scientific down here. It's not testable, observable, demonstrable. You know, it's not um, actually, you know, you can't prove it down here. But the Bible says it's going to be like that up there. You see, the Bible says in Isaiah 64, verse 4, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. And in 1 Corinthians 2.9, Paul actually refers back to Isaiah 64.4, when he says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Do you love 
God, do you love the Lord Jesus Christ if you're a Christian? I hope so. Well, don't you think the Lord has got some good things prepared for you up there? You know, see, we, we experience things down here and it's fine to, to love what God has created for you down here. There's, I've been beautiful places in my life. I've been to Alaska. I've been to Montana, to Costa Rica, to Honduras. And you go down and you see beautiful mountains and, 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 uh, you know, rocky grandeur, you know, as, as it says there in uh, How Great Thou Art. And, I mean, you see these beautiful streams in the mountains, crystal clear. And, I mean, there's some really beautiful stuff here. But the fact of the matter is, it's nothing compared to what God has prepared for us in heaven. You say, well, what's it look like? I don't know. But I can trust that the Lord is powerful enough to be able to create a perfect heaven for us to dwell in forever. And I can trust him with what my body is going to look like when I get to heaven as well. I don't have to worry about it. Okay, the Lord's going to work that stuff out. But let's continue here. Another part of the question that was asked to me, and, and this is a, a perfectly fine thing in marriage, this is a perfectly acceptable question to ask, and uh, the question was asked, what about intimacy between a husband and a wife? And the Bible says about that, 1 Corinthians 7 verses 1 through 5 says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. It is perfectly fine to have, and I'm going to try to be, you know, unoffensive here, um, it's perfectly fine to have intimate relationships between a husband and a wife. The marriage bed is honorable. It's what the Lord says there in Hebrews 13 verse 4. And the bed undefiled. But now if you're living together in, you're not married, well first of all it's fornication, but it says they're whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. A whoremonger is somebody who is two people that are living together and just having relations without any desire to get married, without any commitment to each other. It's just a fun pleasure thing and we'll just have a fling here and, you know, live together as long as we want and if it doesn't work out, well, no big deal. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Okay? You're supposed to, if you're going to have those relations, you're supposed to take on the commitment of providing for that wife and the wife is to be to take on the commitment of guiding the house, of being a keeper at home. That's the way it's supposed to work. Now, if these relations end in the resurrection, do you think that God has something better planned? Oh, I certainly do. And some people say, oh, but man, you know, I really enjoy that intimate relationship with my wife. You know, if you're married. I'm not married, but, you know, if, if you are, I know that people... That's a thing there, okay? And it's perfectly fine. It's not perversion or anything else. It's perfectly fine, that relationship between husband and wife. It's supposed to be there, okay? But let me ask you a question. You say that you really enjoy that, okay? Well, when you were a child, did you think about sexual relations? No, not really. When you were little, uh, did you enjoy childhood? Yeah. You know, were there things that got you excited and, and that you had a lot of fun with and, and just really were neat to you? Well, of course. Intimacy doesn't come around until you get to be in your teens and you start to realize how things work. Okay, and then you get married and then there's that relationship there. But you can live life on this earth and you can live life in eternity without having those relations. And the Bible plainly teaches 
that in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. I'm going to show you what the angels are here as we continue. But uh, let's look at some verses here about children, some interesting things. Mark chapter 10, verse 13 it says here, And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Now look what's said here in Mark 10, 15. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms and put his hands upon them and blessed them. Now, that's very important to understand. When it comes to your faith in the Lord, you should have a childlike faith. You know, a child doesn't worry about the economy, little child. A child doesn't worry about daddy having enough income to pay the bills. They don't even think about that stuff. They don't even understand it most of the time. A child doesn't worry. They have a, a father and a mother, hopefully, to take care of them, and, and that's it. Okay? And that's how we should be with the Lord. That's how our relationship should be with the Lord. We shouldn't say, well, I don't, man, I don't know if God can take care of this. I don't know if God can provide it. I don't know. Don't do that. Just pray about it and say, what's in the Lord's hands? He'll take care of me. Don't worry. And I've seen some Christians that have that childlike faith with the Lord, where they just say, oh, the Lord takes care of me. And that's it. They're not saying it to be spiritual or neat or anything. They truly believe it. They just say, oh, God will take care. God will provide. I'm not worried about it. That's the way it should be. And you will receive the kingdom of God, that spiritual kingdom, that spiritual fellowship between you and the Lord. Uh, it says there in Romans about that, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but let's see if I can remember this peace, righteousness, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what you'll have if you inherit the kingdom of God, but you have to come as a little child with childlike faith. Now, we're going to go to the third and final uh, reference to this thing of the Sadducees coming to Jesus and asking him the question. And each account is a little bit different, and I want to make some points with, you, with each one. But it says here, Luke chapter 20, verse 34. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, meaning eternity, and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. That's going to be important later. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he calleth the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. Then certain of the scribes answering said, Master, thou hast well said. And after that, they durst not ask him any question at all. <laughs> you see, they asked their question there, trying to stump Jesus, and Jesus made a fool out of them. He showed the people, you know, right in front of everybody. He didn't take them aside and quietly, you know, no. Jesus rebuked them right in front of everybody and showed that they were ignorant of the scriptures. And by the way, there are still cults today out there that do not believe in the resurrection. You say, name one. Okay, the Jehovah's Witnesses. A Jehovah's Witness believes that when you die, you go into the dirt. And that's it. And the ones that make it into the kingdom on earth or whatever, you know, they try to make that millennial kingdom, the ones that make it into that are the ones that survive. If you're not living when the kingdom comes, you die and you go into the dirt. And that's it. Unless you're one of the 144,000, you know, special Jehovah's Witnesses that pay more money, you know, then you can go to heaven, I guess. It's re really a ridiculous uh, cult. I was going to call it a re religion, but it's not. It's a cult. Okay, the Jehovah's Witnesses are messed up. Okay, don't ever fall for them. And make sure that you're studied too because they are very well studied and they can make a fool of you very quickly. 
Uh, if you don't know what you're talking about, if you don't know your Bible, if you are ignorant of the scriptures as the Sadducee, Sadducees were. But I read there in verse 36, Luke 20, verse 36 says about the children of God being the children of the resurrection. And you say, what about the children there? Well, the children of God, which you are if you're saved right now, you are now a son of God. Okay? And we're going to see about this. Now, what are we going to look like when we get to heaven? Well, I'm going to show you what the Bible says. Okay, well, I think that it says, you know, I think I feel that this is a way. No. Your beliefs have to be centered upon the Word of God. King James Bible. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Now, if you want to listen to the angel's message that I talked about earlier, I get into the thing of the sons of God. And the sons of God back in the Old Testament, which fell, which left their first habitation, came down here to the earth and got messed up. Back in the Old Testament, that's every time you read sons of God, you know, especially in the book of Job, you'll see that they are angels. And those sons that fell are now going to be replaced by the resurrected saints, the Christians, members of the body of Christ. Okay, and it says there in the one verse there, uh, verse 2, 1 John 3, 2, it says, It doth not yet appear what we shall be. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that when you're here on this earth, when you get saved, you aren't instantly transformed into a resurrected saint. Okay, that comes later. Okay, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35. We're going to read down through to the end of the chapter. This talks a lot about the resurrection of the dead, the dead saints in Christ. There were a lot of questions about that. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 says, But some man will say, How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. Okay, now that doesn't mean that some of us are going to turn out to be, you know, beasts and others fishes and others birds and others men. It doesn't mean that. Okay, he's just talking about flesh, explaining different types of flesh. Verse 40, 1 Corinthians 15, 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also, see, he wasn't, he wasn't explaining the resurrection there. And I know the Mormons kind of get messed up on the celestial bodies and the, and the different things there. But uh, verse 42, he just, he starts out by showing he was, he was just comparing with things in nature. It says here, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. If you die right now, your body will go into the ground and rot. Your soul and your spirit go to be with the Lord, but your body's down there, rotting. It says, it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. When you raise from the dead, it will be in incorruption. And we're going to see when that happens here in just a little bit. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, your body here on the earth, and there is a spiritual body body. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. As I said earlier there in 1 John chapter 3, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. 
Okay, You do not have your resurrection body right now. And the body that you have is not the body that you're going to have in eternity. It's going to change. Okay, And I believe it's going to be like the body of Jesus Christ. You're going to be given the body of an angel. And there are no female angels. Just the way it is. Okay, continuing here, verse uh, 47. 1 Corinthians 15, 47. The first man is of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And look at this, verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now you say, now wait a second. What's this talking about? The first man is of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Well, the second man is very easy to identify. It's Jesus Christ. But who is the first man is of the earth earthy? Well, we're going to see about that. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Who was the very first man? Adam. Okay, it says here, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Now look at this one, verse 2. Uh, Genesis 5, 2, it says, Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name, their name, not his name, their name, Adam. In the day when they were created. Now that's very interesting right there. God didn't say, hey, I created Adam and Eve. He said, Adam. Why? Well, because the woman was taken out of the man. All right? That's the way it is. Okay? And, you know, if you want to get technical, a man or a woman is just a man with a womb. And, of course, there are other differences there, but that's the main difference. A man cannot bear a child. Uh, by himself. Not going to happen. Okay, and a woman, she has the ability to have a child, but she needs a man to become with child. Okay, um, in this life, in other words, you're going to bear the image of Adam. And in the resurrection, who are you going to bear the image of? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you're going to bear the image of Jesus Christ. But let's continue here. When's this going to happen? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Okay? Flesh and blood, your body that you have on this earth, is not the body that's going to go to heaven. It's going to be changed. We're going to see about that here in the next couple of verses. But let me just say something else, too, as far as uh, an interesting study that you can do, compare Adam with Jesus Christ. Okay? Adam had a bride, his wife Eve, and she sinned. And Adam, the Bible says that Adam was not deceived. And he knew what she did. It wasn't that Adam was dumb and ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil unknowingly. He knew what he was doing. And he wanted to, he died with Eve. And in like manner, Jesus Christ also has a bride. And he knows that the bride is guilty of sin and is going to be facing God's wrath. So he dies for his bride. See, there's a lot of similarities. I can't get into all of them, but it's a very interesting study. But let's continue here. Uh, some more scriptures here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 51 through 58, very important portion of Scripture. It says here, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
Okay, the passage dealing there with the catching away of the saints, the rapture, which will happen before the time of Jacob's trouble. Here are the other studies on that if you're cur curious about that. Excuse me. Uh, now, where are the resurrected saints in heaven? Is there any scripture on that? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 12, the charity chapter. And it's charity, not love. It says here in verse 8, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Speaking about your earthly life. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Verse 10, But that when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Okay, now what's the that which is perfect? Well, it's Jesus Christ. I'm going to show you here. Verse 11, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am, even as also I am known. Now, a lot of people interpret that as when the Bible is completed. And see, they were had to sign gifts, but when the Bible's completed, then the sign gifts go away. Well, I do believe the sign gifts went away, but it wasn't because the Bible was completed. I think it was because the Jews as a nation rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, and the sign gifts went away. Okay, because the sign gifts went away before the Bible was completed. So that argument really doesn't work. But that which is perfect is come uh, was actually Jesus Christ. That's the perfect that came. And how do you know? Well, verse 12 says, but then face to face. Face to face with Christ my Savior. You know, that's what's going to happen when you get to see Jesus Christ at the rapture. You're going to see him for the very first time. And it's interesting there. It says that, you know, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man... I put away childish things. Now, like it or not, brethren, <laughs> and for you sisters out there that are listening, the fact is, I do believe that when we get to be to heaven there, when we get to be with the Lord, we're going to be conformed to his image, and we're going to become like an angel. And the angels are all men. We will become a son of God. We will become a man. You know, it's not going to be a big change for me, but, you know, for some of you sisters out there, it will be a big change for you. That's just how it's going to work. Okay, 1 John 3, 2. We read this earlier, but I'll read it one more time to just kind of drive the point home. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but when we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Again, reinforcing what I said. Now, what about some scriptures that talk about what where the saints are when, when you get to heaven? Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 11 says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Now, we didn't read the verse. It's verse 8. Revelation 5, 8 talks about the 24 elders. And, you know, and then it goes on to talk about that they were redeemed out of every kindred, tongue, people, nation, and redeemed by the blood. So it's definitely talking about Christians, but there are obviously more than 24 saved Christians. Okay, so where are the rest of them? Well, I believe that the rest of the Christians there are the many angels of verse 11. Okay, now, here's an interesting thing. Will there be any marriage in heaven? Well, you say no, because in the, in, the, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. That's correct, but in a strange way, there will be a marriage. 
And this is interesting. Acts chat or yes, excuse me. Revelation chapter 19 verse 5. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and the, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See, thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Hmm. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Two points I want to make. First of all, the angel that's talking with him says, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Talking to John. Almost like he's a resurrected saint. Like a Christian. Very interesting. But the other point I want to make there is that it says about the lamb's wife. And it calls her, you know, her and she. And John is reporting what he sees. Hmm. Very interesting. Second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2 says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, my question is, will the lamb, or the wife of the lamb, be an actual woman? Is there gonna, are we gonna get up there and, you know, here's the resurrected saints and then somehow there, there's a woman there or something? Uh, I don't know. Let's continue reading here. Revelation 21 verses 9 through 11 says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Hmm, the bride. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now what is the bride according to those scriptures there? Revelation 21. The bride is a city. What's the city look like? Does it somehow resemble a woman or, or something? I have no idea. I'll just be honest with you. I have no idea. Okay? I'm a child. I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of, of God Almighty. I'm one of his sons. Okay? And I'm just going to trust my father, my Abba father. I want to trust him that he's going to take care of all that stuff. You know, if I got up there, I don't think I'd be able to understand very much. And you say, well, did anybody ever come up or go up and come back down? Well, you're going to hear some people that say that they did today, and they're going to try to explain heaven, and I don't believe a word they're saying. I believe that there's only one man who went up and came back down and was able to talk about it because it's part of your inspired Bible. Second Corinthians chapter 12 verses 1 through 5 says, It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Now, what Paul experienced there, and I believe it was when he was stoned to death, there in Acts, and they thought he was dead, and they carried him out of the city, and it, he stands back up again, and goes back into the city to preach. You know, <laughs> quite an example for us Christians today. But I believe what happened is, when he died there, I do believe he died, and I believe his soul went up there, and your soul, if you would die before the rapture, I believe that your soul goes up to heaven, 
to be with the Lord, and you're there, but you look down and you can't see your hands, and you can't see your legs or your body. That's why he said, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Okay, but he was caught up there and he saw what heaven looked like. And he said that he heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. And he said earlier about, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So God has things planned up there that would just blow your mind if you got to see it and come back down here. Believe me, the Lord's going to have all this stuff worked out. Don't worry about it. Okay, and you say, well, you know, maybe it's not going to be that good, and boy, I sure enjoyed my marriage down here, and I just can't stand to think of the thing of going to heaven, and my wife is another man, she's an angel over there, and I'm an angel, I'm a man, and they're all men, and boy, I don't know if I like that idea. Well, Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 through 24. This is where we're going to end it, this study. It says here, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. It's interesting because the very worst that can happen to you down here on this earth as far as you being killed for the Lord Jesus, if you're executed as a Christian, Jesus Christ gets glory for that. Rather interesting. But verse 21, very well-known portion of Scripture, it says here, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. It's far better to be with Christ in heaven than anything you can experience down here. And when you and your wife, or if you're a woman, you and your husband, when you get up there to be with the Lord, whatever God has planned for you, it's going to be far better than what you are experiencing down here on this earth. Far better. The Lord's got it worked out. And you say, well, boy, I'd like to go today. I would too. But uh, Philippians 1.24 has the solution to that. It says here, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Right now, it's more needful for the lost out there for us to stay here on this earth. The Lord has a purpose for you being here, Christian. He has somebody that he wants you to talk to, some work that he has for you to do. Maybe he just wants you to be praying for people. I don't know. you got to figure out that on your own. I can't tell you what your calling in life is. That's between you and the Lord. Okay, But figure it out. It's important that you abide here. That's why you are given life. Okay, You might be the only Christian somebody ever runs into. So it's important that you stay here and do the work of the Lord while you can. Because it's going to affect your eternity too, by the way. Uh, rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. But in conclusion, let me just say, as far as marriage and resurrection is concerned... Uh, I've said it before, I've never been married. I don't know anything about marriage, but I've, as, as far as personally, but I have seen and studied married couples for many years now, and I've seen that some, it's kind of like they, uh, the only thing that keeps them together is their mutual hatred for one another. <laughs> you know, I've seen those types of marriage. But then I've seen those marriages that it's just like they're best friends. There's the intimacy there. The, they're just, they're made for each other. And when one of them dies, it's just, it's like the part of the, the one that's left here on earth, it's like part of them is gone too. You know, and, and they just dream about being able to get to heaven. And I, I know a brother wrote to me and he said that his wife, uh, I think they'd been married for over 40 something years, or at least known each other for 40 something years, and, and she went home to be with the Lord here not too long ago, and he said he's really having a hard time with it. And you want to believe that in heaven, you're going to get there, and you're going to, there she's going to be, your, your beautiful wife, and she'll come running out to you, and you'll embrace and be together forever. And you can't imagine, you can't think of the thing of, well, maybe she'll be a man. <laughs> 
you know, she'll she'll be an angel there. And, and oh, I don't know if I want to believe that. Well, you're going to have a tough time finding scripture to prove that in heaven we look the same as we did here. Things change. But God's going to work it out. Believe me, God's ways are higher than our ways. Okay, he's got things figured out. And, you know, you have a lot of other problems, too, if you believe that a husband and wife are going to stay the same for all of eternity. Uh, there's some other things, too, there uh, that you're going to have a hard time with. You know, and another point I want to make, too, is don't fall into the temptation to make things that you love here on earth into what your heaven is going to be. Um, as I stated earlier, the Bible says, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, and neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. It's perfectly fine to enjoy life down here on this earth, to thank God for the blessings that he bestows upon you. But don't fall for the thing that to think that heaven is going to be an extension of this life. It isn't. God has things planned for us that our earthly minds can't even handle. Okay, it's... Man, I am looking forward to heaven. I'll tell you what. It's going to be something else up there. And now if you're married down here on this earth and you're happily married and you, you love one another, enjoy your spouse. If you're a woman, enjoy your husband. If you're a husband, enjoy your wife. That's perfectly fine, perfectly acceptable. Okay, it's ordained of God. It's honorable. And thank God for your husband or your wife. You know, the Bible says in everything, give thanks. And that's a very important thing to do. And make sure that you are both serving the Lord, too, by the way. It's perfectly fine to enjoy one another's company and to go out to eat and go on vacation and whatever else. But make sure that you don't spend your whole lives pleasing your flesh pleasing one another. There are going to be times when you're going to need to sacrifice a little bit of time, together time, to serve the Lord. And make sure that you do some of that sometimes. Not so much that it's a strain on your marriage. You know, you have to be there for one another. You took the responsibility to get married. So there's going to be some times when you're going to have to, you know, not do the work of the Lord as much as a single person can. But, uh, just make sure that you keep things in balance. The Bible says do all things in moderation. Okay? So that's going to be it for this study. Uh, it's a subject that is kind of hard to accept. I realize if I had a beautiful wife, I'd have a hard time thinking that she's going to be a man in eternity. But the Lord's going to work that stuff out. Don't worry about it. Okay? I thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.